The .NET Core podcast is supported by our listeners who have become patrons. To see a full list of the patrons, or to join them, head over to .netcore.show slash patrons. Hello everyone and welcome to the .NET Core podcast, an award-winning podcast where we reach into the core of the .NET technology stack and... With the help of the .NET community, present you with the information that you need in order to grok the many moving parts of one of the biggest cross-platform multi-application frameworks on the planet. I am your host, Jamie Gaprogman taylor This episode will be slightly different to most of the episodes of the show, as I'd love to talk to you all about why having empathy, sympathy, and compassion for the people who use our software, apps, games, services, and everything else that we build is so vitally important. I honestly think that these are the most important skills that anyone in the technology industry can have. Almost anyone can learn to write code, and design patterns can be picked up as we go. But these so-called soft skills are the real cornerstones of being able to write great quality software. If you like this episode, let me know via Twitter, the DMs are open, or via the contact page on the show's website. If enough people like these kinds of monologues, then I'll happily create more. So let's sit back, open up a terminal, type in .NET New Podcast, and let the show begin. Before we start, I'd like to talk directly to our neurodivergent friends. There might be some things in this episode that you might have difficulty in applying. This episode is not meant in any way to embarrass, trigger, or upset anyone. I do not have the language or knowledge to help you to better apply these points, and for that, I am sorry. But there are experts out there who can. May I suggest the following resources as a port of call if you would like to learn more about this episode's topic. Uh, For the links, click onto the show notes. There's a full transcription. Programming Ethics on Wikipedia. The IEEE Code of Ethics and Ethics in the Software Development Process on Springer. There are also a number of books listed at the end of the show notes, so definitely check them out too. A brief history lesson. Before I talk a little about empathy, sympathy, and compassion, we need to go back in time to explain why I want to talk to them. As Dr. Jania Ramirez said in her 2022 book Femina, You cannot be what you cannot see. If we want to be more empathetic towards, have greater sympathy for, and show greater compassion towards our users, then we must know what that means. So let's take a look at what these things are and what they are not. I'm going to switch into dad mode and tell you all off, but only a little because as we'll soon learn, shame has the power to stop people from achieving anything. I'm going to give you an overview of some of the things that I've noticed in the last couple of years of my own development practice. Working with a lot of different companies and to different deadlines means that I've met a lot of people in the last 8 to 10 years. I've started my own software development business a number of years ago, and I've run into a lot of developers who are, well, rude would be an understatement. So I want to talk about empathy, sympathy, and compassion, and why it's a required skill for the work we do. But in order to do that, we have to go back more than a few years. In fact, we have to go all the way back to the 1960s. It's the counter-cultural revolution, and people are discovering electronics, computers, and the start of digital technology as a whole. The Cuban Missile Crisis, the Second World War, and a number of other tense political situations which led up to the 60s have forced the US government's hand in providing a previously unprecedented amount of financial support for technological and scientific research in the United States. During the first half of the 20th century, and the decades that followed, more and more money was being spent at US colleges which specialised in research and development into computers, digital technology, and their uses. One of the colleges which received the most financial support for computer-based research was MIT. At this time, there was a small group of people at MIT called TMRC, which stands for the Tech Model Railway Club. The people in this group were interested in the layout and building of model train sets, and they would spend hours building the best possible model railway in a room which the faculty thought was abandoned. Because the folks in the TMRC used electronic train sets, 
they often needed to climb under the giant tables which held the model railway in order to fiddle with the electronics. These particular folks started using the phrase hacking to describe how they were putting things together with almost no engineering practices. For instance, junctions would be patched using cables with almost no thought to proper wire management, and circuits were generally unsafe to tinker with. The TMRC were discovered by MIT security, and rather than being disciplined or kicked out of college, they were offered the chance to work on a recently purchased set of PDP computers. Their job? Create a system which would allow anyone at MIT to access the PDP's resources from across campus on smaller, much cheaper, dumb terminals. Fast forward a few years and they'd done it, but with great power. The team of engineers whose job it was to look after the PDP system and the network would receive messages from users asking for access to things, requesting password resets, and so on. The standard kind of IT support that we've all likely faced in our lives. These engineers started calling the users who would send these requests user with a silent L, aka losers. This doesn't work too well in audio, but I've tried my best to convey the idea. As Scott Hershevitz says in Nasty, Brutish and Short, If we treat people inhumanely, we should never be surprised when they return the favour. As soon as you start talking about people in a negative way, you've immediately lost compassion for them. You immediately don't care about them. And this is something which continues to this day under the name of banter. Side note here, I absolutely despise banter in a professional environment such as an office. The jokes, which are told with the defense of banter, are almost always filled with venom. I've seen more than a few companies that have had a negative or even toxic culture because of the amount of jokes told under the umbrella of banter. Some of these have lost amazing people through people quitting because of the culture, and at least two that I know of have actually ceased trading because of the banter. If you have that little contempt for your users, then it's going to come out in your everyday language, not just when you're exchanging banter, being silly, and talking about what you do. But you're also going to react like that when the users report something that's actually wrong with your software. And if a user knows that you're going to scream and shout at them when they contact you, they'll stop contacting you. This leads to either users dropping your software from their toolkit, which is extremely bad if you're a software vendor because they'll stop paying, or user-created hacks to get around these issues. Sometimes this leads to shadow IT, which is a big problem in its own right. And the problem is that a similar view of users, managers, and non-developers persists in modern development. It's almost as though the TMRC folks set the standard for behavior for us all to this day, whether we know it or not. I'm obviously tarring all of us developers and technologists with the same brush by saying that we all do it, but it's worth noting that almost every team of developers I've ever worked with has had someone with this attitude of contempt for the users of the software that they manufacture. It's almost baked into how we are seen by those around us. There is a sort of stereotype for developers. Think of a time between the 60s and the 90s. We're talking about a time way before geek chic. You know the type of character I'm talking about, the nerdy, antisocial, wearing a shirt and slacks with a large number of pens in their shirt pocket and a pocket protector. Their square-rimmed glasses are broken at the bridge with tape holding them together. Well, we're not that anymore. And truth be told, we never were. We're not antisocial. We don't need to give that trope any more airtime. I say we ditch that trope and just say to the world, Look, this is us. This is the 21st century developer. We're not antisocial. In fact, we care about people. And there's no one stereotype that fits us all. We're all a diverse and inclusive group of people, and we want to help you to achieve digital greatness. Empathy, sympathy, and compassion. Now that we've had our history lesson, let's learn about empathy, sympathy, and compassion. But first, some ancient wisdom. Do not think this is all there is. More and more wonderful teachings exist. The sword is unfathomable. I've always really loved that quote. Yamaoka Teshu, the author of the quote, was a swordsman from 1700s Japan, right around the time when the samurai were no longer useful as warriors. 
they started to become bureaucrats, lawmakers, and other high-level administrators. I am greatly reducing what actually happened after the Sengoku Jidai, or the Civil War of Japan, which culminated in the Battle of Sakikahara, but I digress. Teshu uses the phrase the sword to refer to swordsmanship, but we can take it to be a metaphor for any kind of knowledge, technique, skill, or learning. Whatever it is that you're studying, there's always going to be something new, something that you can learn, whether it's within your area of expertise or indeed outside of it. As an example of this, I've been reading a lot of books lately which have nothing to do with software development, .NET, or even c and I recommend that you do it too. And each of these books has brought something new to my development work, or has helped to reinforce ideas that I already sort of had. As mentioned in the official biography of Terry Pratchett, Even the pulpiest piece of sci-fi or fantasy could provide what Terry called an exercise bike for the mind. It may not take you anywhere, but it tones the muscles that can. Some of the things that I've recently picked up are The KonMari Technique, as written by Mari Kondo, which is tidying up after yourself. Well, guess what? That's the standard teachings behind solid, clean architecture and clean code. Essentialism by Greg McEwen is about turning down all tasks which do not allow you to achieve the goals that you have in mind. Another example of solid. Think Again by Adam Grant teaches a large amount of things, but it reinforces the idea that our assumptions and our viewpoint on a subject can be wrong, which is why we need to find out the why behind what the user wants to do with software before we manufacture it. Start With Why by Simon Sinek literally teaches us that before we decide on the what, in this case the kind of software to build, or the how, in this case the technologies we'll use, we need to think of the why. Why does the user want to do that thing? This reflects something that Bob Martin talks about in Clean Agile. Uh, He talks about leaving the technology and implementation specific decisions until the last minute. If you want to learn more about the non-development books I've been reading recently and how they've affected my development practice, then check out my CPD logs. Uh, There's a link in the transcription in the show notes. But the most impactful teachings for me have been the teachings of Dr. Brené Brown. In her book, Dare to Lead, Brave Work, Tough Conversations and Whole Hearts, she quotes Stephen Covey. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. We need to understand what it is that the user wants to achieve before we can help them do that. But, taking the task of understanding a little bit further and combining it with Simon Sinek's ideas of starting with why, we also need to understand why the user wants us to manufacture a tool to help them do what they do. It's a reason why the as a user form of user story takes that very form. As a user, I would like to X so that I can Y. The key part being, so that I can why. And you cannot truly understand why the user wants to do what they want to do without using empathy, sympathy, and compassion. By understanding why the user wants to do what they want to do, we can get a greater appreciation for how we can implement it. People don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. So what are empathy, sympathy, and compassion? Dr. Brown has a talk called Empathy vs. Sympathy, Which One Are You? I'll embed the talk, which is available on YouTube, into the full show notes, but the most important part for us is when she says, Empathy is four qualities. Perspective taking, no judgment, recognizing, and responding with relevant emotions. So why is this important? Well, users of the software that we manufacture are going to report bugs, and when they see that the people who can fix those bugs i.e. us, get angry at them for reporting those bugs, they'll be less likely to report them in the future, especially when the standard response they'll receive is a twist on I can't believe it. My system is perfect and you've broken it. It's all your fault. Well, spoiler alert, it's never the user's fault. I'll say that again because it's so very important. It's never the user's fault. It's our fault. We created the thing that they are interacting with. And not only that, we created it to help them to achieve a goal or complete some task. So it's on us to understand why they want to achieve the goal and work from there. A real world example. 
Let's say that you approach a pedestrian crossing. As a pedestrian, I want to stop road traffic so that I can cross the street safely. And you press the button to request that the traffic is stopped. But instead of stopping the traffic, you get a light electric shock. Is that your fault, as someone who pushed the button, or the fault of the engineers who built the button? Remember, this is a thought experiment, and as such, we need to abandon a lot of rules about the world in order to make it work. After all, it's a truthy statement rather than truthful. For this metaphor to work, we have to abandon the idea of a malicious user, i.e. someone who might have intentionally messed with the button to give the users a shock. As long as there hasn't been any foul play, i.e. a malicious user who messed with the controls before we got to them, then it is the fault of the engineers who built the button for the pedestrian crossing, and not the user who got shocked. And that is almost a perfect metaphor for when someone discovers a bug in our software. It's certainly not their fault, all they wanted to do was cross the street safely. But should we look to assign blame in the first place? I say no. Blame, and why you shouldn't use it. Sure, the further away from a developer that a bug is found, the more expensive it is to fix, a maxim that has been proven in study after study since the 1970s. But is it something which should have blame attached? Suppose we should attach blame. Who do we blame? The developer who wrote the code? The developer who peer reviewed the code? The QA engineers who tested the code? The project managers who managed the manufacture and release of the code? The account manager who got sign-off from the client? the business analyst, the client, the end user? If we are to assign blame, then where does the blame sit? We can't and definitely shouldn't point a finger at someone and say, it's your fault. And why not? Because there is no fault. All that has happened is that someone has discovered that there is a requirement or use case that we didn't think about or that we didn't think through fully. Besides, as Dr. Brown says in Daring Greatly, there is nothing productive about blame, and it often involves shaming someone or just being me. If blame is a pattern in your culture, then shame needs to be addressed as an issue. And Dr. Brown ought to know a thing or two about blame in the workplace. It's one of the focuses of her research. If we adopt the scientific method, then there is no failure here, but a success. We found a new requirement or use case. And we should be excited to have a new requirement or use case for the function in our software. This means that people are either using it in ways that they never thought about, meaning that it's seeing wider user adoption, or that it's missing a key feature. This is wonderful, because it means that our software is becoming even more fit for purpose. For the time being, let's abandon the idea of Zavinsky's law, which states that Every program attempts to expand until it can read mail. Those programs which cannot so expand are replaced by ones which can we're going to ignore this because it's a humorous take on the direction that all software projects take, and it's not that helpful for our discussion. If we approach the user who's reported a bug with anger, all we do is inflict suffering on that user, and this will create anger which will be reflected back at us. It's very easy for me to sit here in the recording studio and tell you not to be angry, but we all have to try. In the late Thich Nhat Hanh's book Anger, he raised this point. When we suffer, we always blame the other person for having made us suffer. We do not realise that the anger is, first of all, our business. We are primarily responsible for our anger, but we believe very naively that if we can say something or do something to punish the other person, we will suffer less. Obviously I have mispronounced his name there, so I do apologise. Whilst replacing anger with compassion isn't easy, we must try to do it for our sakes, as well as the sake of our users. Empathy. Let's revisit Brené Brown's description of empathy from earlier. Perspective taking, no judgment, recognising and responding with relevant emotions. We need to try and take the perspective of the user. They are trying to accomplish a task, and the tool which we manufactured in order to help them has somehow become a hindrance. We by extension of what we have made, are stopping them from achieving their goal. We need to not judge. This can be very hard to do, as it can be very tempting to judge the user for having done something which we have deemed to be, obviously, hopefully you can hear the bunny quotes there, wrong. 
but what's obvious to you and me may not be obvious to someone else. We must also remember that we have hundreds, if not thousands, of hours of experience using the tool that we manufactured, whereas our users cannot possibly have that experience as they weren't involved in its manufacture. We need to recognize their emotions. They are feeling a certain way because our tool, which we told them would solve all of their problems, has done the exact opposite. They may be feeling frustrated, angry, lost, hopeless, or any other mixture of emotions. We need to respond with relevant emotions. If we respond with anger, it will just make their pain worse. If we respond with relevant emotions and words along the lines of, I totally understand. I remember when I was putting this part of the system together, and it didn't seem logical to me either, until I realized that. Or, That's dreadful, and I'm sorry. Let's see if we can figure this out. There must be something that I've misunderstood when making this part of the system. Let's go back to basics. Please tell me what it should have done. Then the person will see that they are not alone in their suffering, and that we can help them. In short, empathy is feeling with people. Remember, we want the people who use our software to feel at ease doing it. No one is going to even vaguely enjoy using our software if there is a sword of Damocles hanging over their head. If they know that reporting a problem, a bug, or otherwise, with the software, will lead to them being on the receiving end of pain, they just won't do it. And that will be worse, because they won't achieve the goal that they set out to achieve, and that could cause them to get fired. If they have difficulty using it, it is never the fault of the person who uses the software. As another slightly more grisly example... If I designed a chainsaw which only had the goal of cutting down trees and didn't take into consideration the safety of the people who use it, there'd be an awful lot of people who used it with missing limbs. If you're enjoying this show, would you mind sharing it with a friend or colleague? Check out Podcatcher for a link to the show notes which has an embedded player within it and a transcription and all that stuff and share that link with them. I'd really appreciate it if you could indeed share the show. But if you'd like a few other ways to support it, you could uh, leave a rating or review on your podcatcher of choice. So if you head over to .net core.show slash review, you'll find loads of ways to do that. You could consider buying the show a coffee. The Buy Me A Coffee link is available on each show's show notes page on the website. This is a one-off financial support option. You could become a patron. This is a monthly subscription-based financial support option, and the link to that is included on each episode show notes page as well. I'd love it if you could share the show with a friend or colleague, or leave a rating or review. The other options are completely up to you, and are not required at all to continue enjoying the show. Anyway, let's get back to it. Be aware of what empathy is not, though. Empathy is not pity, or sympathy or knowing but not caring. In order to empathize with someone, you need to care about them on some level. Pity is when you look at someone in trouble and you just say, Well, I hope it gets better. And sympathy is very similar, in that it's accepting that there is pain and hoping that it will go away eventually without you actually having to do anything about it. It will go away eventually, but just hoping that it will go away won't help the person who is suffering. Sympathy is when you say, Oh, that sucks. I remember when I was in the same situation. It's horrid. I can't help you, though. So, uh, bye. What about compassion? Compassion is when you combine empathy or sympathy with a desire to relieve the suffering of the person. We write user stories, and by their very nature, they are from the user's point of view. One user story template might read, As a user, I'd like to X so that I can Y. There should never, ever be any technical detail in a user story. Simon Sinek would say that the technical detail is the how. And Bob Martin talks, in Clean Agile, about leaving the decisions of how we implement things until the last possible moment. We don't want to know about database technologies, interfaces, dependency injection, or front-end frameworks. We also don't want to know about programming languages. We want to know what the user wants to do and why they want to do it the golden nugget of user-centric design. When writing a user story, we need to get inside the mind of the user, figure out what it is they want to do and why they want to do it, and then write it down. 
That way, we shift our mindsets to... As the user, I want to put myself into the shoes of the user and do the thing, so that I understand why they want to do the thing. That way, we understand why the user wants to achieve the thing that they want to achieve. If I can be hyperbolic for a moment, by understanding the struggle of what the user is trying to achieve, we can understand how to make the tool that we are manufacturing more well-suited to solve their problems. And by making it more well-suited to solving their problems, we are designing the software with compassion for the user in mind. Doctors, nurses, and other medical professionals do this all the time. If you've ever been ill enough to need the help of a doctor or nurse, you've likely told them what the problem is, and they've done two separate things. The first thing they've done is they've logically analysed what you've said and figured out the most likely cause for what troubles you. They've taken their vast knowledge of medicine and treatments and figured out the most effective way of treating you whilst doing the least harm. And the second thing they've done is they've listened to what you said and responded with compassion, a real desire to relieve your suffering. No one would visit a doctor who laughs at them, gets angry at them, or gets exasperated with patients on a regular basis. And our jobs as developers, whether we realise it or not, and whether we like it or not, is to manufacture the tools that the people need in order to do things. And that requires us to understand where the user is coming from, what they want to do, the why behind what they want to do, and the metaphorical, emotional or physical pain that they may be feeling. Another real world example. Back in episode 48 of the show, I spoke with Dylan Beatty about many different things, including the Rockstar programming language. But one of the things which came up was compassion for the user. Here's a direct quote from him. There are imbalances here. I remember years ago, a um, friend of mine was uh, studying to become a lawyer. And for various arcane historical reasons, the legal qualification process in the UK basically involves jumping through arbitrary hoops for three years in a row. And they have these application windows where you have to submit applications to various you know, legal firms to do internships and stuff. Um, and it's all run through a centralized agency. And the software that's used for this was, I mean, horrific. It was one of the worst pieces of user interface design and reliability I think I've ever seen. Um, and, you know, the people who built it, I'm guessing it was just one outsource project of thousands that they did that year. But to these students, you know, that's, if they miss this window they are not going to qualify as a lawyer because there is no redress, there's no negotiation, there's no appeals process. You have to work out how to get through their shitty website to get your details. And at that point, you go and go, did that even work? I don't know. You know, you sort of want to sit the, the developers down with the people doing it and go, your code is making somebody cry at three o'clock in the morning because your crappy error handling might jeopardize their entire career. You know, how do you feel about that? So I think some developers would be like, yeah, we didn't get paid enough to do it properly. I think some developers would be like, it was just a job. I think some developers would be like, oh my God, we need to fix this. This is not acceptable. We need to do better. In this example from Dylan, there's a real honest pain that the users of the system felt. They may not qualify for a job that they have worked their entire life towards. In the UK, you need to take four years of undergraduate study at a university, followed by three years of specialised study at a law school, before you can start the application process that Dylan is referring to. That's seven years on top of primary, secondary and further education. According to the Law Society, most solicitors qualify at the age of 29 or 30. That's a lot of someone's life that you're going to delay if you don't care about the people who are using the tools that you manufacture. This is the potential pain that we're putting out there when we think It doesn't matter. It's just a null reference exception which leads to a stack overflow. It'll work, just don't enter a minus three into this box. But to someone out there, this is a big deal. Because they won't know that they aren't supposed to enter a minus three. Or they might enter a minus three because they have a legitimate reason to do so. And when the software breaks, they'll come to you. And you'll just be angry at them. Unless you try to empathize, sympathize, or show compassion, and understand why they entered a minus three. And that's even if the user can get a message to you. The system that Dylan was talking about has no way for a legitimate user to send a message through asking for help. There's just a form with a large amount of inputs, where users will take a long time typing their inputs, then a button for submitting. If the page turns out, if there are illegal characters, if the user pastes from a word processor, 
They simply get a generic error page and are sent back to the beginning, but with all of their hard work removed, so they have to start it all over again. Being open and frank. There are lots of other contributing factors, and certainly a lot of other key players, in creating the trope of a developer who doesn't care for the people who use their software, treats them like dirt, and approaches them with a distinct lack of empathy, sympathy, and compassion. But as I said earlier, we're not that group of people anymore, and never were. We're more than 20 years into a whole new century, and we, as an industry, do fantastically well at accepting people into our communities. We are empathetic, sympathetic, and compassionate towards those in our community, or those who want to join. So why can't we extend that outside of the us in our communities? Granted, we have a long way to go, but we're already way better than most other industries. But how do we get there? In my opinion, every time something breaks or every time something goes wrong for a user, we need to have an open, frank, and honest conversation about the software that we built. We build things as teams, and we need to all discuss what we've built. Do we discuss who built what? No. Do we discuss who is to blame? No. We need to talk about the thing that we built and the impact it had on a person. In every company, there will be some blame, even those who claim not to have a blame culture. It's a sad fact of how companies and teams are run. Jamie was the one who pushed the production, so it's his fault. If we spend time navel-gazing over whose fault it was, we'll never get to the important bit. The fact that there are users out there who are in pain. They are the ones who matter at a time like this. In fact, Will Smith, of all people, has been quoted in Adam Grant's Think Again as saying, It doesn't matter whose fault it is that something is broken if it's your responsibility to fix it. Shame and blame. It's become the in-vogue thing for companies and technology teams to claim that they don't have a blame culture. Whilst I've not worked with every company on the planet, I've worked with enough to know that most of these companies who claim to not have a blame culture actually use blame and shame on a regular basis. Dr. Brené Brown is one of the leading researchers on the subject of shame and blame. Reading any of her books will be a masterclass in how shame and blame destroy a team's culture, be it a team at a workplace, a sports team, a classroom full of students, volunteers, whatever. I'll repeat one of my favourite quotes from Dr. Brown's work from her book Daring Greatly. There is nothing productive about blame, and it often involves shaming someone or just being mean. If blame is a pattern in your culture, then shame needs to be addressed as an issue. When software is broken, or a user is facing an issue and is in pain, we should only care about the most productive ways to fix that problem. Blaming and shaming will get us nowhere near to fixing the problem, let alone doing it in a productive manner. So what do we need to do in order to be productive in fixing the problem for the user? Being user-centric. The only way to fix problems that a user faces is to be user-centric. Every thought, decision, and design must be done in a way which is focused on why the person wants to achieve their goal. They want to use the tool to do something. What is that thing and why do they want to do it? Only then can we be productive at fixing the problem for the user. So let's get past blame, shame, and navel-gazing and focus on what the user is saying when they report a bug or error. This has caused me pain. This has caused me an issue. This has stopped working. It's not helping me to achieve what I need to do. Because that is what matters. We need to step back and think about why the code allowed the user to end up in that situation. You need to ask questions like, Is that a valid input that we thought was invalid? Does the UI have accessibility concerns? Have we built this to be colorblind friendly? What about people who use screen readers? Does a workflow make sense for someone who hasn't been intimately involved in the software's design? You need to talk about the execution of the software. Is it running in a way that allows for the user to interact with it? We all know the pain of the spinning mouse cursor followed by the active window graying out, followed by our operating system telling us that the application has stopped responding. We, as technologists, know what that means. But the people who are using our software may not. According to Colorblind Awareness, around 4.5% of the UK's population are colorblind, with an estimated 300 million people worldwide. 
That's the same number of people as the entire population of the United States of America, according to the latest census at the time of writing this episode. That's a lot of people who you are leaving unable to use your software if you don't design them with them in mind. But what about blind people? According to the Royal National Institute for Blind People, there are 340,000 people in the UK who are registered blind, with an estimated 40 million blind people worldwide. Sources for those statistics can be found in the show notes, by the way. And what about our neurodivergent friends? They have accessibility concerns too. All of these people could be your users, and they could be struggling to use your software right now. Designing with empathy, sympathy, and compassion in mind would help them out greatly. You might think that you don't have time to design with these users in mind. In fact, you might think, Our software is about selling books, so we don't need to worry about blind people. And if the decision makers can back that decision up with a clear business rule and justifications, and are ready to face any backlash over it, then fair play to them. The problem is that there are accessibility laws and policies for software, and there may even be laws in your very jurisdiction which state that you have to design software with accessibility in mind. Whatever you decide, or most likely whatever is decided for you, is never the user's fault. If they push a button and it drops the production database, it's not their fault for pushing it. Even if the button is clearly labelled, drop database, don't click it Jamie because it will break the world, Someone is going to click that button simply because it's there. And it's not their fault. Unless, of course, they really are malicious users. But if it's an average person who's using the software and they click the drop database button that you've served to them and you've allowed them to drop the database without challenging them, for instance, without prompting them for authorization or whatever, then that's on you. That's not on the user. I'll say it one more time for clarity. It is never the user's fault. Next steps. How do we move forward from here? Well, the first thing is to start thinking of the effects that our decisions have. Steve Worthy is a good friend of mine, and he recently said the following in an episode of his podcast, Retail Leadership with Steve Worthy. The effects of your good decisions can change the world around you. And he's spot on. I added the good into that quote, but the point still stands. Whatever we do, whatever decisions we make, they affect the world around us. So the first thing we need to do is not see error and bug reports as personal attacks. Because they're not. When we focus on what's being said, I'm in pain and this thing caused it. I can't do the thing I need to do with this thing. Please fix it. Rather than the perceived attack that we feel because of it, we can start to understand the why a lot more than the what. What? The software is broken. Why? because the user wants to do something and we didn't understand what it is they want to do. We're not going to get it right every time and that's not the point. We can't be perfect, regardless of what Aristotle taught with virtue ethics. We just need to be a little bit better tomorrow than we were today. In the words of Michael Shaw, To demand to perfection or hold people to impossible standards is to deny the simple and beautiful reality that nobody is perfect. So I'm not saying that we should be perfect, but I think we should attempt to apply an Overton window to our attempts at being better. An Overton window is a concept from political science. It's a metaphorical window into a topic which is seen as tough to reason about or controversial. Over time, the Overton window will move with popular culture, and the topic which was initially seen as controversial or difficult to reason about will become accepted and part of our daily life. The examples I could give on Overton Windows fall outside of the scope of this episode, so I leave it as an exercise for the listener to go check them out. But just being better tomorrow than you were today is enough. Until the Overton Window moves on, that is. We should be the change we want to see. If we want to see more user-centric discussions about our software, more thoughts about the why rather than the how or the what, then we should do it. When we are gathering requirements, we should be asking users what the why is. And if the person we're asking doesn't know, then they should be asking too. Or we should find the person who does know. We need to be more careful with words too. I was at a talk given by the comedian Robin Ince in the summer of 2022, and he said, Words are like shrapnel. They cause a lot of hurt in many tiny ways. 
The words and attitudes that we choose to use can have dire circumstances for those who hear, read or consume them. So we need to think about what we're going to say before we say them, or type them, or communicate them. Because you really don't know whether the words you're about to use will hurt someone. Never blame the user. If you served them with a page that has a big red destroy the universe button, and they clicked it, and it destroys the universe, then it is not their fault at all. Some users might click the button out of curiosity, and some users might click it accidentally. Others still might click the button because their cat ran across the desk and knocked their mouse. It is never the user's fault. But then maybe I'm wrong. Neuroscientist, musician and creative researcher Dr. Charles Lim has this to say about telling someone that they've got their facts wrong. I tell them humbly, because that assumes that you think you have yours right. Could I be wrong? Sure. But will it hurt anyone to apply these thoughts and ideas? I'm pretty sure it won't cause too much harm for us all to be more empathetic, sympathetic and compassionate to those people who use our software. And of course, we must demand that from the vendors of the software we use too. Resources. I've used a lot of resources to build up this episode of the show, including a number of books, videos, podcast episodes, and discussions with people. Here are some of the resources that I would recommend people take a look at when they're done listening to or reading this episode. Brené Brown on Empathy. Psych to Go on Empathy versus Sympathy. Simon Sinek on Understanding Sympathy. Nasty, Brutish, and Short by Scott Hershowitz. How to Be Perfect by Michael Shaw. Any Book by Dr. Brené Brown. Think Again by Adam Grant. Hackers, Heroes of the Computer Revolution by Stephen Levy. The Friendly Orange Glow by Brian Deer. The TV show The Good Place. Episode 48 of this very podcast. An episode of Clear and Vivid, a podcast with Alan Alder, called To Be Creative, Don't Think So Hard. And a talk that Simon Sinek gives called The Law of Intuition. I've also had long conversations with a ton of very smart people, all of which led to the creation of this episode. Some of those amazing people are Steve Worthy, Susie Buttress, Dylan Beatty, Zach Brady, Alan Underwood, and Jay Miller. That was my episode on empathy, sympathy, and compassion. Be sure to check out the show notes for a bunch of links to some of the stuff that we covered and a full transcription of the interview. The show notes, as always, can be found at .netcore.show and there will be a link directly to them in your podcatcher. And don't forget to spread the word. Leave a rating or review in your podcatcher of choice. Head on over to .net show forward slash review for ways to do that. Or reach out via our contact page at .net show forward slash contact. And if a friend of yours or a colleague of yours has sent you this episode, head on over to .net show forward slash follow for ways to keep up with the show. And obviously come back next time for more .net goodness. I'll see you again real soon. See you later, folks. .NET Core Podcast is a production of RJJ Software.